Okay, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for the uh, invite today to speak to you about insect problems on dry beans. And if you'd like to con connect a face with the survey that is sent out to you that uh, Mitch mentioned, the dry bean grower survey, I'm the person who sends the surveys out to you. <laughs> And I thought I'd start with the drought monitor, which does not look very good for North Dakota. And I'm going to speak to you today about two pests that are a big problem when we have drought. First, it's grasshoppers. And in the photo, you can see some of the common grasshoppers that we have here on our crops, red-legged, two-striped, and the differential grasshopper. The young grasshoppers are called nymphs. They look just like the adults, but are smaller. They have wing pads instead of wings. And yes, that means they can not fly. So they'll be crawling from the egg sites into the field edges. They go through five to six instars or grow stages, uh, depending on the species. The grasshopper life cycle has one generation per year. It takes 40 to 60 days to go from egg to adult. If you look at the winter, they overwinter as eggs and pods, and they're usually in the soil about two to four inches deep. As the temperature warms up to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, the eggs will hatch and we have the tiny first instar nymph emerging. They're about the size of a weed kernel. And we have peak egg hatch about mid-June. And then they'll go through several growth stages, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And eventually they'll molt into the adult in late summer. And then the, they'll mate and the females will lay eggs into the soil in the late summer into fall. Each female will lay eight to 25 pods and each pod will contain about 20 to 120 eggs. There's two important times to scout in the NIM stage and the adult stage. The damage caused from grasshopper on our crops is from their chewing mouth parts. They'll strip the leaves and cause defoliation. They feed on the pods and can actually clip the pods as well. And when we have rural high population and food is scarce, they can migrate in large numbers. However, we don't have migratory locusts anymore in North America. They are extinct. The last one, the Rocky Mountain locust, went extinct in 1902. And as you can see in the old time picture, uh, they eat just about everything that's an apple tree that's completely defoliated and debarked. So the grasshoppers need fairly warm temperatures to get going feeding. They need to warm up the internal temperature to 60 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They do this by basking in the morning sun. So when emergence time comes, we often see the common lilac blooming. 10 days after the first bloom, 75% of the grasshoppers are emerged in the early NIM stage. Of course, if you like a more scientific method, you can use degree day models that use a base temperature of 64. And as you can see in the white table, uh, it indicates when you'll see the different instars and adults. In the IPM survey program, we monitor for grasshoppers using sweep nets. And you can see in 2019, we had fairly high populations as indicated by the yellow square and the red triangle. But as you go over to 200, 2020, we have even more yellow squares and red triangles. So there is increasing populations of grasshoppers out there. And they increase when we have warm, dry, late springs that promotes uniform hatching time and good weather conditions for feeding. And when we have hot summers with adequate rainfall, that's good, provides good food supply for them and low incidence of diseases that infect the grasshoppers. And late fall, 
long egg laying period. So you get lots of eggs in the soil. There's two different methods to um, assess grasshopper infestations, both the dimps and adults. You can visually inspect the field once a week and count the number of grasshoppers per square yard or use a sweep net. And when you have high levels, it's important to get out to the field every other day. Now the nymphs we're gonna see in the ditches where the eggs are laid and also in the field edges, usually in the spring, as I mentioned earlier. And then the adults will be later in the summer into fall and they'll be anywhere, ditches, field edges, and in the interior of the field. So we have the threatening level of grasshoppers, which is our action threshold. It's the number of nymphs or adults per square yard. And then there's a threshold for the margin or the field. And it's difficult to count grasshoppers when they're a lot of them and they're moving around fast, but you can use your sweep net for 180 degree sweeps is equal to a square yard. There's many different insecticides registered in dry bean for grasshoppers. The top two, 1B IRAC class is organophosphates. The 3A and the light orange color are all pyrethroids, and that's the most dominant class that we have. And then the bottom ones are premixes with two different modes of action. You can see the cost of the insecticides ranges depending on which chemical you select, but also be aware of the pre-harvest intervals. Some of them are quite long, 30 to 45 days. And grasshoppers are often moving into the fields close to harvest. That's when they're most abundant. And we have the adults then with wings that are very mobile. There's many natural enemies that attack grasshoppers and they are important in um, keeping the grasshoppers in check. So that's why we recommend that you use the action thresholds. And there's nematodes, protozoans, and fungi. Many people see these red mites. I get many calls on them, but they do not actually kill the grasshopper, but they will weaken it. Okay, the next insect, or actually not an insect, arthropod is the two-spotted spider mite. Uh, they're very tiny. You'll need a hand lens or head mounted magnifier to find them. They're yellow and they have two dark spots on the sides of the abdomen. They attack over 500 different plant species, crops, ornamentals, and trees. They primarily overwinter as eggs in North Dakota on vegetation like alfalfa. It takes five to 19 days to go from egg to adult. The warmer the temperature, the faster the development. And they do the best when it's real hot in the 90s and dry. They damage the plant by piercing sucking mouth parts and they feed on the plant cell and extract the sap. And at first the damage looks like little white spots or leaf stipplings as you can see in the top photo. Then the leaf will go yellow and bronze and then eventually drop off under severe infestations. Now the webs disperse throughout the field by webbing. They move up to the top of the plant and then they balloon on strands of silks on the winds. And this uh, damage from the spider mite causes a decrease in photosynthetic ability of the plant and water loss and it will impact your yield. So when you go to scout for spider mites, it's best to start on the field edges because they're gonna be moving out of the grasses and alfalfa fields that are cut and drying down and then moving into your field. So scout multiple sites and walk a U or W pattern. I do have a scouting uh, U2 video on spider mites and soybeans. So you can watch that. The technique is the same as well as the action threshold. Uh, mites are most problem on the dry beans from early flowering to past full seed. 
and the action threshold that's been developed is just heavy stippling on the lower leaves with some progression into the middle canopy. Obviously the mites are too small to count. So we have to use this general rating system. So for insecticide guidelines for mites, it's very important to have high water volume. The mites are on the undersides of the leaves and they start at the base of the plant. So you need adequate water volume, 10 gallons per acre by ground and five gallons per acre by air. And then if it's real dry, you might wanna consider adding an adjuvant to make sure that spray droplet gets down to the plant and doesn't evaporate and use a higher labeled rate. You need to avoid pyrethroid insecticides because they actually flare the mite population. The only exception is the active ingredient by fenthrin. And you need to go back and re-scout the fields five to seven days after you treat because the insecticides do not control the eggs. And if you do need to do a second treatment, you need to alternate modes of action to a different new mode of action so we don't get the insecticide resistance development. And here's the insecticides and miticides registered for spider mite control and dry beans. Organophosphates again at the top, the orange of pyrethroids by fenthrin only, and some premixes. And then at the bottom, you'll see the miticides that are registered. And again, some of them are very expensive compared to our insecticides. But pay attention to the pre-harvest intervals. Mites also tend to be worse towards the end of the season as we get close to harvest. There's many natural enemies of spider mites and they do a good job most years, um, except when we have hot droughty conditions, they tend to surge. And especially this predatory mite, he does a very good job. And remember back in 2019, we had a lot of defoliation caused by the caterpillars, the green clover worms and thistle caterpillars, and they were even getting into our pods and feeding on them. Well, we use primarily the pyrethroid insecticides. So remember when you spray that, and if we're hot and drought, we're gonna be flaring those spider mites. So it's important to go back to the field to scout for spider mites. And we're also killing all the natural enemies when we do the application. So that's uh, all I have and hopefully I'm pretty close on time, but thank you so much for your time and attention. Mm -hmm.